But Vandenberg was a master politician. He, he somehow managed to be flexible and principled at the same time, and he had the credibility in the eyes of many that went with being the reformed sinner. He spoke with the conviction of somebody who had fought for that isolationist position for much of his career. In fact, he'd always wanted to write a biography of St. Paul, although his own conversion was a little bit more drawn out. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. This episode takes us back in time to September 2018 for a talk from our Acton Lecture Series. Students of 20th century American history know the importance of the Marshall Plan to the effort to rebuild Europe after World War II, as well as the leading role taken by the United States in building international institutions and alliances that would be central to maintaining peace and checking the expansionist desires of the communist world. What you may not know is that a central figure in the creation of those institutions was a United States Senator from Michigan who, prior to the war, had been a leader of the isolationist faction in Congress. The story of how Arthur Vandenberg came to be one of the founders of modern American foreign policy is recounted in the book Arthur Vandenberg, The Man in the Middle of the American Century, from Hank Meyer. Hank Meyer is co-chairman and CEO of Meyer Inc. in Grand Rapids and vice chairman of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. He serves on the executive committee of the Food Marketing Institute and is a trustee of the National Constitution Center and the Henry Ford. He is a member of the University of Michigan's President's Advisory Group and the Ford School of Public Policy Board of Advisors and chairs the board of the Kettering Foundation. His biography of Senator Vandenberg was published in 2017 by the University of Chicago Press. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today. He is a thoughtful intellectual and a gifted researcher and author who has written two terrific historical biographies. The first, a biography of his great-grandfather, I'm sorry, his grandfather, Thrifty, Thrifty Years, The Life of Hendrik Meyer, and the second, which is the basis and theme for today's luncheon lecture, Arthur Vandenberg, the man in the middle of the American century. Now, I don't know what the definition, the formal definition of a bestseller is, but this book is increasingly hard to find. Um, It's a great book, and people literally are buying it, and we've been all over town trying to get extra copies, and the good news is we have them available for you at a discount today. So after the lecture, uh, Hank has kindly offered to sign some for you, so I hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity. I first got to know Hank, I think, in 92. It might have even been 91. I remember a summer evening on... on, uh, um, in East Grand Rapids, Acton had a little event, a picnic, and this guy came and came. I don't know how we got your name and how you uh, came to come, but uh, he's been a supporter of, of our efforts ever since. Uh, as you might know, in addition to being an author, he's also a business guy. You might have heard of the business even. Uh, but I want to also thank you, Hank, and uh, thank Meyer for being good at what it does. Uh, and I think Meyer is an example of the good that business can do and just providing high-quality goods and services that, that raises the standard of living for everybody. Meyer is a great example of the unsung service that is good business. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Hank Meyer. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. I, I thought we were the only ones selling the book at a discount. So. <laughs> uh, uh, but and thank you all for coming out on this rainy day. This is a treat. Um, 
Harry Truman, whose time overlapped and who we'll be talking about today with Arthur Vandenberg, famously had a plaque on his desk that said, the buck stops here. Arthur Vandenberg had one too, and it was from the ancient Persian, but it's, and this too shall pass. And so I, I got this from one of his grandsons, and so I've always cherished it. And this is the first time I've brought it out on an occasion like this, but it's fun to share. Um, thank you all for coming. It's, um, it is a real pleasure to be here today and in a setting that, in a place that I already think of as venerable. I'm, I'm a great admirer of Father Sirico and, and Chris and what the Acton team has created here. And it's, it's, it's a gift to our community and it's a place that uh, energizes the debate in our country. And I think that it is just a wonderful thing. Um, it's also in the, the same block where the subject of today's conversations began his rise to prominence. Um, but not to, uh, to, to jump right in, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, maybe the most consequential peacetime action in the history of American foreign policy. It's a story with many chapters, but one of them begins right here in western Michigan with a local boy who helped make it possible. Now, back in 1990, when I began researching this book, if you walk down the street in Grand Rapids and ask someone who Arthur Vandenberg was, most people, I t and I did this with a few people, thought he was related to the owners of a longtime jewelry store by that name <laughs> on Monroe Avenue. Some of you may remember, he was not. Um, it's funny how history seems to conspire to elevate some legacies and obscure others, and you could say that happened to Arthur Vandenberg. The, so we'll begin with a little more familiar face, our 38th president. Arthur Vandenberg was becoming a world figure in 1946 when he met a young lawyer just out of the Navy. The distinguished senator with his comb over haircut and puffed up ego was back in town only briefly, stopping in at his office at the Pantland Hotel. He'd just come from a post-war peace conference in Paris. And Jerry Ford was hanging out his shingle with a local law firm. But Jerry was also the fresh face of the home front movement a group including his father that was challenging the corrupt Republican machine of Frank McKay. And two years later, in 1948, Vandenberg was, refu was fuming over the refusal of his own hometown congressman to support his efforts to win approval of the Marshall Plan and other important legislation after World War II. And he was happy to see a challenge to the Republican incumbent, Bart Yonkman, who was also a McKay man. So Ford called on the senator, and Vandenberg let it be known that he was backing Jerry Ford. But our story really starts at the beginning of the 20th century, when a teenager just out of Grand Rapids Central High School fell under the sway of the most exciting politician of the era, Theodore Roosevelt. Vandenberg was, Arthur Vandenberg was born on Washington Street in 1884, the son of a harness maker who nearly went broke when Arthur was nine years old. His dad blamed the uh, Cleveland administration and, and uh, cheap money, and there may have been canceled government contracts involved. Trying to help support the household launched him as an entrepreneur. He set up a delivery business with other boys pushing carts of shoes from a factory downtown to the railroad station. And he was something of a prodigy in government studies. He claimed he'd been reading the congressional record since he was 14. We have no evidence of this, um, but nothing to contradict it either. But his first job after graduating from high school was working at a biscuit factory downtown. And he was fired the day he left that job to join a campaign parade for the charismatic young governor of New York, Teddy Roosevelt, who came to town in the fall of 1900 as a candidate for vice president on the ticket with William McKinley. And I think of, of Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, having an influence in that in 1900, the same way John Kennedy might have in 1960, where you've got a young generation who was just energized by this charismatic young candidate. And young Van was both fired and inspired. He soon got a job as a reporter for the Grand Rapids Herald, whose office there, uh, his office was just maybe, what, 50 yards east of where we're sitting right now. He soon became the Herald's most prolific reporter, covering the police beat in City Hall. And his first byline, when he was still a teenager, was a big story on the Electoral College. He was a regular Republican when the city and the state and much of the country outside the South was all mostly Republican. 
He was not yet 22 when the longtime editor died and the paper's owner, Republican Senator William Alden Smith, tapped him to be editor. He married his high school sweetheart, a West Side girl, but in 1917, at the age of 33, she died, leaving him as a single parent with three small children. And soon after, he reconnected with a woman he'd met during his very brief one-year stint at the University of Michigan. Hazel Vandenberg was writing advertising for the J.L. Hudson Department Store in 1918 when their courtship began. Later that year, they were married. Here's that courtship at Ottawa Beach, north of Holland. After World War I, Vandenberg fought for reservations to Senate approval of American membership in the League of Nations. That He tried to find a compromise between supporters of President Woodrow Wilson, who came back from Versailles refusing to make any changes to the covenant that he'd negotiated with the other uh, victorious powers, and Wilson's opponents, led by the Republican chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. Vandenberg sent Lodge and other prominent Republicans his editorials, his arguments on subjects like the League of Nations. And in reply to one, Lodge wrote back, I'm going to steal your line. Unshared idealism is a menace. And Vandenberg also wrote speeches for presidential candidate Warren Harding, and then three books inspired by his hero, Alexander Hamilton. None of which, by the way, were optioned for theatrical or motion picture performance, uh, and, and they didn't deserve to be. But the subtitle of this, and I don't know if you can read it, was a, something he never backed away from. It's called The Trail of a Tradition, and he's trying to imagine uh, the course of American foreign policy. And this is as a young editor in Grand Rapids in 1926. And he says, nationalism, not internationalism, is the indispensable bulwark of American independence. And from his second floor office in the New Herald building overlooking Veterans Park, the editor and publisher was making a name for himself on the national stage. He was also preparing to chase his dream and run for the United States Senate in 1928 when the incumbent Democrat, Woodbridge Ferris, as in the university, died and he was appointed to the seat. So expectations were high when Arthur and Hazel arrived in Washington and Vandenberg was eager to work with the new president, Herbert Hoover, who was a, a moderate and seemingly very capable Republican, a brilliant engineer and administrator, but Hoover had never held elective office. He lacked finesse, to say the least, in working with Congress, and then the stock market crashed in 1929, and that doomed his presidency. So then Vandenberg tries to work with the new president, Franklin Roosevelt, after FDR's landslide victory in 1932. And he's a savvy politician in a state that's turning a little bit purple, and he's also ready in a time of national emergency to cooperate with the Democratic administration, so he supports some of the New Deal, early New Deal remedies for a crippled economy. And he has one of his own, savings deposit insurance, to protect small depositors and save the nation's banks. Hoover had fought him on this, and FDR does too, but Vandenberg lines up the votes in the Senate, and a new law creates the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, Roosevelt comes to see the value of it, and, and very much to Vandenberg's chagrin, is all too happy to claim credit for what may have been the most successful of all New Deal legislation, but it was the brainchild of Arthur Vandenberg. As the reach of federal power grew, however, Vandenberg tried to draw a good Republican distinction between being social-minded and socialistic. He broke with Roosevelt over executive rulemaking that he regarded as too intrusive. He was a vigilante when he thought the New Deal was overstepping the Constitution. Nor could he abide Roosevelt's attempt to tinker with the Supreme Court because it had rejected some of the president's legislation. And this hardening of Vandenberg's opposition to FDR was coinciding with world events that posed new dangers. The rise of Hitler in Germany and Mussolini in Italy threatening peace in Europe and the Japanese war cabinet ordering an invasion of China. In 1934, he is elected. Uh, he was actually elected in the fall of 28 after six months in office, but then re-elected in 1934, which was a devastating midterm year for Republicans, and so he was one of the few standing. I think there are about 17 Republicans left in the Senate at that point. Uh, 
but in the face of threats around the, and so his stature and seniority and everything else rose quickly for, as a result of that as well. In the face of threats around the globe, Vandenberg fell back on what was for him a first principle. He recalled Washington's farewell address, written by his hero Hamilton, warning the young republic to avoid taking sides when the European powers collide. Let there be no entangling alliances, Washington warned. To Vandenberg, that meant one thing as war clouds gathered again, American neutrality. And it was neutrality that he preached. And here he's preaching it at the Ionia Free Fair. Uh, not about to be stomped by those Republican <laughs> elephants, but uh, trying to, to draw a line that would prevent Roosevelt, who he distrusted completely, from entangling us in, a, in another war. And again and again, he led the Senate isolationists who stymied Roosevelt's attempt to aid the European democracies. In 19, September of 1939, however, Debates about neutrality took on new urgency when German bombers filled the skies over Warsaw and German tanks rolled into Poland. Over a national radio hookup, and this is from a baseball field at Ramona Park in East Grand Rapids, Vandenberg declared, this is not our war. Before it became our war, with the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, he led the band of isolationists, mostly Republican, but Democrats too, who fought Roosevelt every step of the way, fearing that American boys would be pulled into combat in another distant war. The isolationists fought and lost a fight to keep the arms embargo in the 1937 Neutrality Act that Vandenberg had helped create. They fought and lost a fight over the Lend-Lease deal, giving destroyers to the British Navy. Roosevelt was their nemesis, and Arthur Vandenberg was their organizing spirit. And if you've seen that new movie about Winston Churchill, Darkest Hour, uh, you may recall the phone call, which Churchill scholars tell me is, is not far from accurate, but the phone call where Churchill makes to, uh, the, the Churchill makes to FDR pleading for the release of weapons that the British had ordered. And it was Arthur Vandenberg who was leading the effort to prevent that from happening. But in the wake of 1934, as he emerges as a Republican spokesman and a higher profile figure, um, along comes the election of 1936, he'd avoided Kansas Governor Elf Landon's attempt to draft him as his vice presidential running mate, which was a, a smart move because FDR carried every state except Maine and Vermont. But in the run up to 1940, he was viewed as a leading candidate for the Republican nomination. In fact, in 1938, the FBI opened an office here in Grand Rapids. When an agent was sent here, when, when the agent who was sent here was asked about his new assignment, he said he'd been told he, he was here to keep an eye on Arthur Vandenberg. So we talk about the FBI being involved in politics. Um, uh, many of you remember Ralph Howenstein, and, and Ralph, who became city editor at the Grand Rapids Herald after Vandenberg had gone to Washington, was my source for this, and always just had the single source, although I trusted Ralph implicitly. Um, you know, my, my memory is failing in my 60s, and Ralph was, you know, 99 or something when I talked to him. Um, but just a couple of months ago, I was relating this story to a retire, an FBI agent who retired locally. And he was explaining to me the, the FBI's structure, which I had not been familiar with, where the FBI has divisional offices in all the major metropolitan areas. So in this region of the country, it would be in uh, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, Milwaukee. And then where they have smaller offices, they report up through those divisional offices. And the, the former retired agent I was talking to said, you know, my colleagues, and, and that's what Grand Rapids does today, but he said, my colleagues and I could never figure out why when our office was set up, it reported in directly to J. Edgar Hoover. Now you think about 1938, the depression is still going. Other than the McKay corruption, this is not exactly a hotbed of organized crime or mob violence or something. And what is the FBI doing opening an office? And I think I, there's no reason not to believe that, that Ralph didn't have it right, um, or that Ralph had it right. So, but Vandenberg and his isolationist colleague in the Senate, Robert Taft, were swept aside in 1940, along with their traditional isolationist point of view, by a charismatic lawyer, Wendell Wilkie, whose willingness to intervene in Europe nearly matched Roosevelt's. 
And Pearl Harbor then made up Vandenberg's isolationism look obsolete, and America was all in in a global war. As the war began to turn in favor of the Allies, who were dubbed by FDR the United Nations, Republicans faced two big questions. One was partisan. Wendell Wilkie was what today might be called a rhino. He had been a Democrat before he ran for the Republican nomination. He was regarded by most of the GOP establishment as an opportunistic interloper. Any comparisons to the present day will get a little confusing. And his nomination reflected a deep schism in the party, one that is still with us today between isolationists or unilateralists on the one hand or internationalists or those who believe in broader global cooperation on the other. And if the Republicans were going to have a chance at the presidency in 1944, and here they'd been out of power now for a dozen years, these factions needed to come together. But how? The other question was on the minds of Americans of all political stripes. What would the world look like after the war? And what role should the United States play in it? Would we retreat again as the United States did after World War I with uh, uh, staying out of the League of Nations. Back then, Vandenberg's editorials had faulted Wilson and the proposed League. Now the question was whether and how nations might organize themselves to try to avert future catastrophes. And Roosevelt wasn't saying. Senators and congressmen had all kinds of ideas. Bills were bubbling up in congressional committees. But FDR, and I can't fault him for this, was Dr. Win the War. When the Democrats in Congress tried to introduce resolutions in the House or Senate, he quashed them. He did not want to rock the boat or risk alienating our allies. We're in the middle of a war, and clearly the Soviets had designs on their neighbors. The British had an empire they were hoping to reclaim. Once you start talking about freedom and justice in the United Nations, both parties, for different reasons, might start to get a little anxious there. And FDR was a one-man band in foreign policy. In fact, his State Department was often on the sidelines. When there were important missions to Stalin or Churchill, it was Harry Hopkins who went to London or Moscow, not Cordell Hall, the Secretary of State. So to answer that first question about Republican unity, the GOP called a meeting of leading elected officials to be held at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island over Labor Day weekend in 1943. And for those of you who've been to the island, you may recognize the porch of the Grand, and there's Vandenberg reclining. He was chosen to chair the foreign policy group challenged to find common ground. Not for the first time, he looked for a middle way. In this case, between the isolationists, who just were eager more than anything to bring our troops home out of the war and after the war, and many of them were his longtime friends and allies, and the Wilkie adherents who held varying ideas about world federalism and international police force and certainly a revived League of Nations. And here's, here they are meeting in the what was then called the casino at the Grand Hotel, and to Vandenberg's right in our picture, to his left are Robert Taft and California Governor Earl Warren. And... They came out of that meeting at the Grand with a statement they could run on, an expression of support for some sort of world organization that wouldn't compromise American sovereignty, but that went beyond anything Roosevelt or the Democrats had yet offered. And the wonderfully ambiguous, grandly named Mackinac Charter set the stage for things to come. When I succeeded in putting 49 prima donnas together, Vandenberg told Henry Luce of Time Magazine, and it certainly took one to know one, I discovered <laughs> the necessary formula. So for Vandenberg, compromise was almost an art form. He was moving away from isolationism. Pearl Harbor had played a part. So did his nephew, Hoyt Vandenberg, an Air Force general and student of modern warfare who had been in London for the Battle of Britain and would drop by Uncle Arthur's Connecticut Avenue apartment on a Sunday afternoon to talk strategy in the kitchen. Vandenberg's mistress, probably planted by British intelligence, probably had much less influence, but it's just kind of fun to talk about. And by contrast, he relished the favorable press response to the Mackinac Charter as the GOP suddenly grabbed the spotlight in advancing support for what would become the United Nations. Even as he was moving in a new direction, however, it was chiefly behind the scenes, and most of the public still thought of him as the voice of isolationism in the Senate. And that changed on January 10th, 1945, 
The Allies were winning the war, closing in on Japan island by island, pushing across the Rhine into Germany, and a weary Roosevelt, in poorer health than anyone knew, was about to leave for the Russian resort of Yalta on the Black Sea to meet with Stalin and Churchill to talk about what to do as the collapse of the Third Reich drew near. And Vandenberg was worried. Neither he nor his colleagues knew what the three leaders would be deciding or what deals FDR might commit to on our behalf. And so he did what he did best. He decided to speak up. He needed to write a speech. And on January 10th, he rose in the Senate to propose a post-war security treaty among the victorious allies to ensure that Germany would never again wage war on its neighbors. Boom. This was the Senate's leading isolationist calling for an American commitment to an entangling alliance with countries that had fought two world wars in the last three decades. It was, as one correspondent said, the speech heard round the world, a renunciation of beliefs he had espoused for 25 years. Now, when asked about Vandenberg's speech, FDR spoke rather dismissively, but the White House made a hasty request for 50 copies before the president departed for Yalta. And within months, the world and Vandenberg's place in it changed very quickly. Roosevelt returned from Yalta knowing that he had no choice if he was to avoid Woodrow Wilson's fatal mistake with the League of Nations after World War I, other than to appoint Vandenberg, the leading Republican voice on foreign policy, as a delegate to the conference to be convened in May 1945 in San Francisco to create the United Nations. And here is Franklin Roosevelt meeting with that delegation the, from the, the Vandenberg is second from the right. Uh, third from the left is his Democratic counterpart, Tom Connolly, with whom he traded chairmanship of the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, the far right and far left are the Republican and Democratic chairs of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. A uh, very young naval commander and boy wonder governor of Minnesota, Harold Stassen, is in the middle next to Vandenberg. And next to him is uh, the, the Secretary of State, Edward Statinius, who had succeeded Cordell Hull and who was brand new in the job. The, and then Franklin Roosevelt died. Vice President Harry Truman had had lunch once with the president after he was elected. He was a neophyte in foreign affairs, although a decisive one. He quickly announced that the UN meeting would move ahead the following month. Since Roosevelt had often worked around the State Department in crafting foreign policy, Edward Statinius, the new Secretary of State, was a, a marginal player. Tom Connolly was a canny old politician from Texas, but rather limited in his range. And that left Vandenberg, the Republican who'd come to speak out first in favor of such an organization, to emerge as the most influential American delegate. When it came time to sit down with the other powers in the penthouse of the Fairmont Hotel to design what Vandenberg liked to call the town meeting of the world, his opinion and that of the Soviet foreign minister Molotov seemed to be the ones that mattered most. Penthouse of the Fairmont Hotel, and this is the, the Americans meeting with the Russians, the Chinese, the British, and the French. This was really was the, the nucleus of what became the Security Council. And it's interesting that in, he brought, Vandenberg brought along as his advisor um, John Foster Dulles, who was an advisor to Thomas Dewey and, of course, would later be Eisenhower's Secretary of State. And then um, they were joined by Nelson Rockefeller. And Dulles is at the right, Vandenberg with his back to us, Nelson Rockefeller to the left, who was the young assistant Secretary of State for Latin America. And it was important at the UN that the United States could get the votes of all its Latin American neighbors because there were so many countries that had been, were under, were still under, were still uh, in wartime settings or were colonies or were, had been part of, related to the Axis powers, that that block of Latin American votes was really helpful if you wanted to get your way with the UN charter. And with, the, with Rockefeller's help, he made sure the charter allowed for regional security arrangements so that with the Monroe Doctrine, the U.S. and its Latin neighbors could have a mutual defense treaty. And he made sure there would be enough Republicans on board to approve the charter when it landed in their laps. And here's Vandenberg signing the U.N. charter with President Truman looking on at the far left. And after the charter was ratified, 
the president asked Vandenberg and Connolly to play an unprecedented role in diplomacy. They were two of the four original American delegates to the first UN General Assembly in London in the fall of 1945. Uh, the other two were Stettinius in the middle and Eleanor Roosevelt, you may recognize. Um, and I like to talk about Vandenberg and Eleanor Roosevelt because they had a very difficult relationship because the, Vandenberg and, and the Republicans viewed Eleanor as this very liberal voice whispering in FDR's ear and where FDR may have been the consummate pragmatist, they worried that Eleanor's pulling him to the left. And Eleanor has all these schemes for federal projects that Vandenberg regards as boondoggles, including one for a planned community in West Virginia where the cottage industry would be making furniture, which didn't sit well at all for the senator from Grand Rapids. Uh, and Eleanor bitterly resented her Vandenberg's attacks on her husband. There was, there was no love lost at all. But they sailed together from, from New York to Southampton, and by the time they got there and, and they saw each other in action, and they were making common cause in a world where there was an emerging Soviet threat, um, Arthur writes to John Foster Dulles and says, you know, I take back everything I ever said about her, and it was plenty. And Eleanor writes to Arthur and says, please stay on, you know, join us for the next General Assembly. And I said, geez, you know, I wish I could, but I got to get back to my job in the Senate. But it became a little bit of a mutual admiration society. And I just, I find something heartening in that. Um, but they were, after that General Assembly in London, uh, more significantly, they joined the new Secretary of State, James Burns, for conferences with foreign ministers in Paris. These are negotiating peace treaties with, the, with Italy and, and other countries that have been uh, fighting on the, on the German side. Um, and they met in the Luxembourg Palace in Paris. And this was, went from the late fall of 45 all the way through most of 1946. And that was also the year that Look Magazine published a profile of Vandenberg, and there's a couple of paragraphs in their story that I love to share. Um, Every few months, wrote Look, several million people become grateful to Vandenberg for expressing their vague thoughts, such so as, what is Russia up to? And in, 19, and in the fall of 1945, um, he gave a speech on the floor of the Senate and he was very proud of that speech, and as was not uncommon at that time, sent out letterhead and envelopes with copies of it to all his constituents and everyone, and it was called Raise the Iron Curtain. Uh, it was delivered in, I think, not, can't read that, I think it was October of 45, and he got a note from John Foster Dulles, said, great speech, too bad nobody heard it. It was like, it was the same the same week or the same day that Eisenhower returned triumphantly from Europe and was given a great parade and everything and was the conquering general having come back from, um, from Europe. And the, it just, the news cycle buried the story. Um, and so it wasn't until six months later in Fulton, Missouri, when Churchill gives his Iron Curtain speech that the, the phrasing, kept, oh, uh, Dulles says, you know, too bad nobody heard it, but you know, the, that phrasing might catch on. Sure enough, when Churchill gives his speech six months later in Fulton, Missouri, it did. Uh, but Vandenberg was a master politician. He, he somehow managed to be flexible and principled at the same time, and he had the credibility in the eyes of many that went with being the reformed sinner. He spoke with the conviction of somebody who had fought for that isolationist position for much of his career. In fact, he'd always wanted to write a biography of St. Paul, although his own conversion was a little bit more drawn out. Um, he returned to Grand Rapids on election eve in 1946 when he was up for re-election just in time to vote. Did not campaign at all. He was there once briefly for a week earlier in, in, the, in that year, which is probably when he met Jerry Ford, and then uh, just in time to vote. But he becomes something of an oracle. It might take a whirling dervish to follow the pros and cons of Vandenberg Senate votes over the past 18 years, Look Magazine said, but Vandenberg has whirled as the American people have whirled, or as one of his fellow senators put it, Van changes his mind about as often as the average American, but slightly earlier. Hey, you know, there's a sort, of, a sort of genius there. He's not a visionary, but, but able to reflect and anticipate what people are thinking. 
and he, he was a great fan of, of Emerson and, and would have known his essay on self-reliance where Emerson says, speak what you now think in hard words and tomorrow, and sp tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words, though it contradict everything you said today. In other words, be ready to change and willing when the time is right, which is maybe what we ought to be asking of our politicians, but we, we, we get suspicious when they do that. Um, but he was bringing millions of anxious Americans with him who had not necessarily, who, had, who were leery of, of more engagement in the world when we had suffered two calamitous wars. And when he, he could speak again with that conviction of someone who had lived through that, reflecting their concerns, but decided there had to be another way after that second war. And that made a big difference when Truman asked for support of the Truman Doctrine, calling for the U.S. to help nations threatened by communist subversion. And more specifically, he was supporting Truman when the president asked Americans to pick up the baton from the impoverished British and aid the governments of Greece and Turkey against Soviet pressure. Um, he also then was elected president pro tem of the Senate, which meant he had additional time to be up on the rostrum when listening to speeches. And he would do these elaborate doodles, which you know, I haven't analyzed too closely, but it's definitely a very tidy mind at work. Um, and that, that can, the, his new approach made all the difference when Secretary of State George Marshall proposed an unprecedented program to help the European democracies rebuild their shattered economies. And, and then President Truman had the political sense to call this the Marshall Plan after the revered general. Marshall himself, though, said it could have been called the Vandenberg Plan because, he reflected, when it went to Congress, Van was just the whole show. He was the center of attention at the Republican Convention in 1948 as well, when it looked like whoever ran would beat Harry Truman. And this is Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia for the convention, and Arthur and Hazel Vandenberg are on a bench, and uh, the, the press is crowded about them. He did not campaign, however, and Thomas Dewey became the nominee. Meanwhile, Americans were learning that rebuilding European economies was not enough. There was also the power vacuum left by the war and now being filled in Eastern Europe by the Soviet Red Army. And the Western democracies, ravaged by war, formed a European Union for mutual defense, but they knew they needed the Americans and invited them to join. And this was the big one, an entangling alliance which Vandenberg had once so adamantly resisted. But the Vandenberg Resolution, one page which he typed himself, enabled American entry into the new North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and it sailed through Congress with Vandenberg's leadership. This is Vandenberg with Marshall's successor, uh, Dean Acheson, as Secretary of State. And these bipartisan majorities were his pride and joy. And they began to fray about the time he was diagnosed in 1949 with lung cancer. And after fighting actually fellow Republicans in the House to secure funding for NATO military aid, he was flown to Ann Arbor for an operation that removed half of his left lung. As Mao and the Communists emerged victorious in China, Vandenberg was headed back to Morris Avenue in Grand Rapids to the house he had built as a young editor in 1907. And as he lay dying, he cherished the daily notes he received from General Marshall, among others, who reminisced about the, day, the chatty notes, I should say, the days when Marshall's undersecretary, Robert Lovett, came by the Vandenberg apartment to flesh out NATO and other significant initiatives. It would have been a great relaxer to sit down and have a drink with you and Bob Lovett and decide just how we were going to manage the world and then have done it, Marshall wrote. And Vandenberg replied, those were truly great days. Looking backward, it is really quite amazing how well we and the world got along together. But times were already changing. Not only had bipartisanship frayed amid recriminations of who lost China, but a young Republican senator from Wisconsin named McCarthy was fomenting fear with accusations of communists in the Truman administration, and war had broken out in Korea. The bipartisan bonds were coming apart, and Vandenberg was not there to patch them up. And that brings us full circle to Grand Rapids. When Vandenberg died in April 1951, his slide into relative obscurity began. News of his death was overshadowed by General MacArthur's address to a joint session of Congress. The general, so recently relieved of his command by President Truman, ended his speech with a line about how old soldiers never die, they just fade away.
but the eulogies began to pour in. With bipartisanship giving way to the McCarthy era and increasing polarization, journalist Edward R. Murrow paid tribute to Vandenberg for his CBS radio audience with words that I'll, I'll close with today. We are now divided, bitterly, hysterically, Murrow observed, noting of Arthur Vandenberg. Had he lived, he would have gloried in this conflict and steadied it, and he would have been confident that at the end of the day, little men of loud voice and small faith will yield to the collective judgment of the American people. Thank you very much. Mr. Meyer, you had uh, referenced uh, just in passing um, Senator Vandenberg's faith and uh, sort of his maybe come to Jesus moment later on in life. I'm not quite sure what to make of it. So I'm wondering if you could expound a little bit more on that, on his faith, his church background, and how that informed his life. Um, I don't want to, I, I don't have too much depth on that. He was a life member of Park Congregational Church, and in fact, um, he twice won a Collier's magazine. They used to give a, you know, a, a prize for the most valuable senator or something like $10,000. This is back in the, in the later 40s. And he won that prize twice. And the first, um, the first time he did it, the second time he donated to the, to the American Red Cross because Hazel had been a very active Red Cross volunteer. But the first time it went in honor of his mother to, um, to Park Church. So Park, he, was, he was always very close to Park Church. Um, he's, he's got a, a wonderful letter to Claire Booth Luce, who of course had famously converted to Catholicism, uh, and, and his daughter, who became a good friend before she died um, back in the, in the late 90s, said the family was always a little worried that, um, that Claire might try to convert Arthur. Um, to our knowledge, she never did, but it, as he was in just great pain in his last months, he, he spoke rather touchingly of, you know, I have a little prayer meeting of my own every night. And so uh, I don't have a lot more to go on than that, but that's, that's his, his background. Um, he also had a very interesting relationship with certainly um, the most famous Senate chaplain, a man called Peter, uh, Peter Marshall, who was a Scots Presbyterian minister uh, who, um, who died very young of a heart attack in his, what, middle 40s when he was uh, Senate chaplain. But Vandenberg was president pro tem when he was, when Peter Marshall was a chaplain, and the, and Marshall would stop by Vandenberg's office off the, off the Senate floor, the, which is the Actually, it's the vice president's office, but there was no vice president under Truman, and so at that time, and they would talk about what uh, what prayer to open that day's that day's session of the Senate with, and um, the Vandenberg always called him. Uh, now I'm really getting in the weeds here, but always called him Domini. And um, for my, my Dutch friends would say, well, that's a reflection of Vandenberg coming from Grand Rapids and knowing the Christian reform terminology or the reform terminology. Um, but then on the other hand, I've talked to Presbyterian friends who say that that's employed sometimes in uh, Presbyterian circles as well. So I'm not sure. But that's, I, I, that's, that would be what, what I have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, coming today. Uh, what was Vandenberg's X factor? What was the qualities of the man that made him so effective in what he did in his life? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. I think the, he, he was always trying to, to, I don't mean to say this in a simplistic way, to bring people together. I mean, in support of, the, of whatever uh, legislation or initiative he was he was proposing. Uh, somebody I uh, was talking with somebody the other day who said, you know, how how would he have compared to John McCain? Because both of them, in some ways, would have been a little bit iconoclastic, and um, and 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 their foreign policy views would have been quite similar. But where McCain was sort of a pure maverick. Vandenberg, it was always important to him to build support for whatever he was doing. And, and that's why he was so influential, because Truman needed the Republicans and Vandenberg could bring along Republicans if, um, 
if the administration responded appropriately. And in fact, um, this doesn't get directly at your question, but it's it's part of the um, couple of different things. The Dean Acheson, who somewhat condescended to Vandenberg, but then he condescended to everybody, um, was um, felt like you know the State Department, the administration would come up with great resolutions, you know whether it's the Marshall Plan or or uh, NATO or whatever it is, and then. You know, they'd send it to Vandenberg, and he'd have to put his stamp on it just so he could claim credit for influencing it um, before it would get passed. But, of course, what Atchison, I think, refused to acknowledge was Vandenberg understood what it took to move legislation through the Senate. He was a real student of the process. And so there's, there's, a, there's a line once where, and I forget which initiative it was, it might, might be during the Marshall Plan debates, where one of his colleagues said, you know, there's a line in here in the resolution that I don't know what this means. And Vandenberg said, well, don't worry about it. I can go to 10 different senators and say, I listened to what you said and I incorporated that in here. <laughs> and so it was that. And, and when, he did, when he did the hearings for the Marshall Plan, they, I don't, they may, I don't, this may no longer be the case, but up till that time, they were the most extensive hearings the Senate had ever conducted. And so it was part of it was almost wearing down the opposition, but willing, being willing to listen to everybody and then saying, you know, now I'm going to try to, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to everybody and then I'm going to bring on board enough people that I can convince are close enough to my views to make it happen. So I think it was that kind of political pragmatism. And, and, then, and then a very forceful, strong personality that could also carry people along in his wake. In when he changed his mind so publicly from being an isolationist to then bringing people together, was he, did he have personal concerns about how he would be considered by his colleagues and constituents? Uh, I th I th well, I think to some extent ego and press adulation played into it. So, I mean, he, 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 he liked it that, that you know, that the media would applaud what he was doing. I, I don't want to dismiss that for a minute. But he'd also, also in his isolationism, he'd kind of boxed himself into, into a corner a little bit in the late 1930s because um, he, first of all, because he distrusted Roosevelt so much. He didn't want to give Roosevelt an inch of, of movement to do something because he didn't know what Roosevelt was going to do. And then in doing that, he saw, he began to see neutrality as a sort of moral absolute. It was something you could cling to in a very messy and complicated world. And, you know, just, we're, we're, and he even talked about, you know, your, your heart tells you to do one thing, but your head tells you to do something else. In other words, it was, you know, obviously he would rather see the British prevail over Hitler, but that was his heart. And his head told him, you know, we went down this road once before and it didn't turn out well. And I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm going to almost put blinders on and I'm going to stay neutral, neutral, neutral. And then, and then you get this sequence beginning with Pearl Harbor. And that's, that's a big shakeup. And then the Mackinac Conference where in forging a compromise, he finds himself speaking out as, as the spokesperson for more Republican engagement. And just before, earlier in that year in 1943, there was a, um, uh, Roosevelt tried by executive order to create something called the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration or to get the U.S. to participate because now um, starting to liberate countries that, have, that had been occupied by the Axis powers. And what do we do? How, we need aid to feed those folks and, and help those countries. And so there's a big meeting at the Greenbrier in West Virginia. And Roosevelt tries to do that by executive action. And, and Vandenberg and some of the other Republicans say, well, this looks like a treaty that you're working on. And Vandenberg ended up negotiating actually with Dean Acheson as an undersecretary and trying to find a way to, to make this sort of early version of the United Nations happen in a way that didn't, that, that required Senate approval, but it wasn't quite a treaty yet. And so these, these little baby steps. And then, and then with, with Yalta, the, um, you could argue that his distrust of Roosevelt was definitely still there, and he did, he wanted to offer some guidance to Roosevelt, and so he's stepping into the and, and he also wants to flush out the Russians. What are their intentions? You don't they don't need to conquer Eastern Europe. They can let those countries be independent. 
if we can ensure that Germany, that they don't need them as a buffer against a yet another German invasion. And so he's, he's throwing out this thing, we'll have this treaty. And, um, and, so, and, the, and so that pushes him along. So it's, it's each of those steps. And then, of course, when you go to the UN and um, you want to make it, you know, make sure the veto and everything works out right for the United States, um, even though he feels like he's doing it from a good Republican background, he's moving in a, in a, in a very international direction. And I would mention also that it, it, it just occurred to me the other day that the, this meeting at Yalta was, nobody really knew, there's still debate to this day of what Roosevelt did or said or committed to. It, but from Harry Truman to Barack Obama, through Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, there was always a sense of the State Department was a part of things, and and you you may have disagree or agree with the president, but we pretty much knew what was on the agenda for each of those meetings. But Yalta at one end and Helsinki at the other, nobody really knows what got talked about, and it's it's kind of anyway I find that kind of fascinating bookends on what had been this this world order for a long time. But thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, in your book, I love this quote. Uh, it was after FDR uh, at the State of the Union, and Vandenberg said, that is not the opening of Congress. It's the opening of a political campaign, which, judging from the tenor of the speech, promises to be hot, rabble-rousing, and intolerant. <laughs> um, so obviously words like that have been said recently of another president. And you quoted uh, Jerry Ford as saying... Uh, um, we may well wonder how, as to how the responsibilities of future issues would be met if Vandenberg were here today. Um, and then later in that page you said, be ready to change the world requires of that of its leaders, but seldom gets it. And when you talked about his bipartisan collaboration at a time when fellow citizens hungered for direction, like now, that goes down the years. And the last sentence that you wrote was, to not note his relevance today seems almost irresponsible. So... Um, in, all, in the midst of all the things he did underground and that folks don't know his name, do you have a sense of, and you talked about his personality, so that also makes me curious, um, what kind of wisdom do you think he would offer right now if he were to see a State of the Union or to see the foolishness or whatever else is going on in our country right now? Well, it's, it's always tricky to try to project ahead like that. And, and the, the, uh, the challenge, I think, is the, the greater challenge is the so much the, the that the Congress has to such a large degree ceded much of its policy making and 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 authority to the executive branch and you know that that certainly a lot of that started under Roosevelt I mean you could say it started under Teddy Roosevelt but a lot of it started under Roosevelt which was part of Vandenberg's problem with FDR. And it's accelerated throughout administration since then, and now the where and this and and so the senators who have have these these Senate committee chairmen for for good or ill, I mean sometimes ill in the case of the of the the Southern Democrats who stymied civil rights legislation, but uh, arguably for good with Vandenberg these. These committee chairs had great power, and the president had to work with them to get anything through Congress. And we just we don't see that today. I mean, you don't even know who the majority leader was when when Vandenberg and Taft were basically dividing up foreign and domestic policy as in the Republican caucus. And and today they they just and and, and the senators had fewer committees, so they became real. Um, experts in their field and they don't have there's just no there's nobody there of that so you have to imagine someone who's able to have that stature and i don't know that the current state of the system allows for it um, and of course notoriously in in both parties we have primary systems that that play to that that work against that impulse to compromise and you know, we can all have wonderful opinions on that, good or ill, but uh, I think that makes it much harder for their to imagine uh, a character like Vandenberg today. You know, they, they, they each, each, and each senator seems much more concerned with their own their own brand sometimes, uh, regardless of their ideology, than with with building that consensus. <laughs>
Hi. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hello, I'm Laurel. Um, thank you so much for speaking today. Um, I guess great minds think alike because I had a very similar question. Um, you've brought a lot of parallels to um, today and our current political landscape. And I was just wondering, um, specifically looking at um, how we're louder, um, how we're uh, kind of pulling away a bit from the international community. Do you have any kind of lessons learned that through your research you think we should apply to today? Well, I, the, um, I, I, I am so leery of pontificating, I, I, I don't want to do it, but, it, but it's interesting. You get things like the, the tariff debate in the early 1930s. Now, how much Smoot-Hawley contributed to the Depression, I don't know, but Vandenberg was one of those people trying to give the president more authority because Congress was notorious for everybody, each, each congressman and senator looking out after their own home industries uh, and, and not thinking in the overall terms of the best interests of the country. And so Vandenberg was convinced that, he, that Hoover would do a better job of that. And so he was fighting to give Hoover more, more trade authority. And now you see uh, the senators today saying, you know, we've given the president too much trade authority. Uh, we need to pull some of that back. And so it is, you know, to some degree you've got a, a pendulum swinging and maybe it's just a matter of, of but, but I don't know, it, it's, it's hard to see things getting pulled back. Um, I don't have good answers for the lessons of today. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, 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 the world has changed so much. And that's, that's why, I mean, when the book first came out, it was almost like this anachronism that, you know, it, it seems like, well, this is, these are days so far gone by. But, but to the earlier question, um, we also find a hunger for the kind of collaboration that seems to have fallen apart. And so, um, and so, and so Vandenberg becomes, Vandenberg becomes a symbol or a shorthand for that, even though, um, there are a lot of different forces working against it today that, that he didn't have to contend with. Up with, uh, with, uh, the McKay pol political machine here. I wonder if you'd expand on that. And uh, secondly, how did he relate, if at all, to Father Coughlin, whose uh, foreign policy views uh, went along the same lines as Senator Vandenberg in his uh, years in the 40s? Um, I, could, I can give a half answer to both of those. Vandenberg went to, this, went to Washington in 1928 and really McKay's influence, and I haven't studied McKay, but was more in the 30s and 40s. And so Vandenberg really didn't have much interaction with McKay. I mean, he didn't, he didn't need McKay to get nominated or elected. And, um, and he wasn't involved in local or state politics once he went to Washington. And so, and so he really didn't have as far as I can, I mean, looking through Vandenberg's papers and McKay's papers and talking to people, they're, they're, I didn't get much interaction. There just wasn't much. And uh, Although in, in 1948, when, no, excuse me, 1940, 1940 Vanden, when Vandenberg had been Michigan's favorite son and McKay certainly had a lot of control over the Michigan Delega delegation to the Republican convention when it was clear that Wendell Wilkie was emerging as a candidate and when it was clear to Vandenberg that he didn't have a chance, as soon as Vandenberg pulled himself out of the race, it was McKay who controlled the Michigan delegates to give them to Dewey and put, or excuse me, give them to Wilkie and put Wilkie over the top. Um, but but other that they really, they just didn't have much interaction. And then uh, with Father Coughlin, they certainly would have, um, they kind of went in opposite directions in the sense that Father Coughlin starts out as a Roosevelt supporter and then um, becomes increasingly isolationist and, of course, devolves into anti-Semitism and, and um, gets really way out on the fringe when Vandenberg is critical of Roosevelt, but then starts to uh, 
move toward more collaboration. So, it, and I hadn't thought about it in that way, but but he and Coughlin kind of kind of go in different directions. And now, the uh, uh, interesting along that line also would be the Chicago Tribune, of course, where the they were the the dominant newspaper of the Midwest, and Colonel McCormick of the Tribune was an outspoken isolationist, which meant that Vandenberg was one of his favorite politicians in the uh, in in the, before the war, and then he regarded him as Benedict Arnold after the war when he was working with Truman. Um, but they and and there was real bitterness there. Um, even though originally McCormick, well, actually McCormick and Vandenberg also had a fight when because Vandenberg was a big supporter of the St. Lawrence Seaway, and McCormick, uh, with Chicago's rail interests and canal to the uh, and connections to the Mississippi, um, was very much and and viewing the Seaway as this unholy collaboration between the Americans and the British in Canada. Um, McCormick criticized Vandenberg a lot for that also. But anyway, I'm, I'm moving far afield from your, your good question. Well, thank you all. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Eric Cohn.